And we had done that with the expectation that the calendar for this week was that we were in the districts and not in DC, but because of the shutdown, we're going back on Tuesday and um, spend some more bills over to the Senate, hope, hopefully to reopen um, government, which we think is important. We'll talk about a little bit more. Thank you. So I'm gonna run through a, a PowerPoint. Uh, mostly about, it is about the current situation because I'm sure that's what you wanna talk about. What we really wanted to do today is help those people who are affected by the government shutdown. So the 800,000 federal employees for the 4 million contractors who by no fault of their own are put in an awful position because of our inability to work out things in the normal legislative process in Washington. Um, and I really wanna thank the county and all the nonprofits who are tabling outside. If you know anyone who's affected by this shutdown, there's lots of help they can get. And I particularly want to thank uh, the banks and the financial institutions and the credit unions who have been so terrific at helping people get into yeah. So there's, there's no reason particularly if you're a federal employee um, that you need to go through this. If you can get into one of the credit unions or the financial institutions, and if you need help, please call Chanel, contact our office because we will advocate for you. Um, we will talk to your mortgage company, we will talk to your lender, um, and we will talk to financial institutions that direct you to the ones that are being so socially responsible. For the contractors, uh, we will advocate for you as well. Yes, it's really important. So, um, as Ryan said, this is the 75th town hall we've had since I, you were nice enough to elect me to Congress four years ago. Um, thank you, I think. And as for those of you who um, have followed my life in politics ever since I was in the city council, I think it's because I was in the retail business and the restaurant business for many, many years. Um, I think this is important and I grew up in Massachusetts and that's where town hall started. So having this, I love social media. As I like to say, I like, I like Twinkle and Facebook, whatever those things are. Um, but I do think this physical meeting together is really the essence of democracy and works really well. So I'm very, very proud that, yeah. that you're all here. And I did have a, um, a constituent who comes regularly, and I won't put him on the spot and mention him, um, but he's a member of the party that I used to be a member of, the Republican Party, and we want to respect all opinions. One of the things that's frustrating in this country right now is that uh, there are too many of us who think if somebody disagrees with you that they are inherently evil or something like that. Um, we want to respect the fact that people have different perspectives and be civil about it. So I hope we will all do that. There's a famous line from H.L. Mencken, I think it was H.L. Mencken, where um, someone wrote him a letter, somebody who disagreed with him, and it was a long letter, and Mencken returned, uh, returned his a letter, and his, his message was simply, Dear Madam, you may be right, H.L. Mencken. <laughs> so I've often thought of sending that to some people who disagree with me, and it turns out sometimes they are right. So with that, um, we're gonna go through the PowerPoint and then take as many questions as possible. Uh, we are going to reschedule the town hall at Clayton Valley. The reason we didn't have, a, have the one that we scheduled for Wednesday today um, out there was because it wasn't available. I also want to thank the school district. This facility has been wonderful, as you know, uh, with very short notice. Uh, the Lafayette School District has been really good about making this facility in particular available. It's convenient because our district, as you will see on the map, this is centrally located, it's reasonably close to transit, and it's close to the freeways, and generally there's good parking. So with that, um, Chanel, we're gonna get started and try to zip through this thing. Yeah, that's not very good. Oh, there it is. Everybody see? Okay. So that's our district. For those of you who are new, we always start with this map. Uh, there are 435 of these maps, 435 members of the United States House of Representatives. There are 53 in California, the largest delegation. Texas is second largest with 36. Uh, there are the 53 members. Um, there are 46 who are members of the party that I'm registered in, uh, Democratic members, and seven Republicans. 
the wonderful thing about this district is it's, it's in one county, which makes it much easier for us to serve. I have colleagues who have very large geographic areas. Uh, Jared Huffman, who used to be my roommate the first couple of years I was there, uh, we had Jared and Beto O'Rourke and the, the three of us, so I have stories about Beto O'Rourke if you want to hear them. <laughs> Only kidding, if anybody's out there listening, they're all good. Um, but well, for instance, Mr. Huffman goes from the Golden Gate Bridge along the coast all the way up to the Oregon border. So when I hear his stories of trying to serve that district, it's a challenge. This one's a great one, and as many of you know, I've represented areas of Contra Costa for almost 30 years now in, in local, state, and federal government. Next. So um, we put this together very quickly, obviously, uh, to talk about the, sh the shutdown a little bit, um, and we'll go through it as quickly as we can. If you can see this, and if you're watching this on Facebook um, at home, you can get this off our social media pages so that if you can't see it up here, you can follow it with us. If you're in the audience and you want to go on those and follow it on your cell phones, you can do that as well. Um, but this is these are what we've been reaching out to to try to get organizations. It's really been terrific and inspiring seeing so many people respond to our neighbors and friends who are being impacted by this shutdown. And as I said, it's, it's no, no consequence of their own actions. Um, and these are the people who are here today, and if we could give them a round of applause, they've been terrific. So again, if you, if you have a friend or a neighbor who's impacted, please let them know that if they live in Contra Costa to contact our office, there are many organizations who are here to help. And there's more every day. I saw in, the, um, in my news clips today, PayPal just said that they were gonna start contributing cash advances. USAA, who's my insurance carrier, um, announced they were gonna do $15 million. And I was just talking to the Coast Guard Credit Union where they can do for all of those wonderful people who were in the Coast Guard and for reasons I don't fully understand, the Coast Guard is under Homeland Security, so that's one of the departments that's not funded right now, rather than the Department of Defense. So all these young people who are in the Coast Guard right now doing terrific work is really, really irresponsible for us not to be paying their salaries. So they can go into the Coast Guard Credit Union and not have to worry about the cash flow problems. They'll get a, a zero interest cash advance. Um, so we want people to know this and want to be able to get the, the support they can. Next. Um, let's see. So this is, this is something we haven't heard a lot about. Um, as some of you may know, I frequently go in to be on Phil Mateer's show. Um, I think people like that because we, I make fun of them, and I, apparently that people like that. Um, actually, we make fun of one another. But this is a, this, there's a real cost to this. So in, in, in 2013, when we went out for a much shorter shutdown, um, I think it was the General Accounting Office came back and estimated that cost about $23 billion to the federal budget. Clearly, this is not good management um, from the administration. This is not the way to manage any organization. So we're going to pay people to not be at work, and, they're not, and you as taxpayers are not getting the services that you're paying for. Um, so that's bad. Um, and as you can see, they've missed $5,000. We're about to get to the next cycle for the next pay period. Um, and it will be, once we miss that, it'll be hard for the, the human relations departments to, uh, human services departments, human relations, I had it right the first time, to get those checks out. So um, here in the Bay Area, um, many of you may know, uh, the country is split into nine um, sections for federal um, employees and departments. Uh, the Region 9, uh, which is this West Coast area, and Hawaii is headquartered in San Francisco, so we've got a lot of federal employees who work for all of the federal agencies headquartered here in, the, in, uh, in California and San Francisco. Next. Um, so this is just a little background over the border wall because what we have said consistently and we are saying after uh, the president just went and made a, a, a statement from the White House is first what we need to do is reopen government. The way this process works and Democrats and Republicans should not shut down the government because they don't get what they want through a legislative process. <laughs> that 
It's not how democracy works. You have a legislative body, you have elections, you introduce a bill or appropriations bill, a policy bill, and then it goes to committee, you've got to get the votes out of those committees, it goes to floor, you've got to get the votes there, and then it goes into the other house and starts over again, and then you work with the administration to get it signed into law. All that period of time you're negotiating with people who you want them to vote for it or not. That is how the process works. It should be open and public and you have votes. I've had lots of things I wanted to get passed that I didn't get the votes for, but I didn't throw a temper tantrum and say we should shut down the government over it. You go, you get up the next day and start over again and try to get what you want. So this is, in my view, part of what's wrong with our country right now. You have legislative rules and policies that are in place. Follow the rules and don't monkey with them and try to get, try to leverage your position. Um, so one of the things here that's important to remember. Um, pe people will ask me, well, what's, what do you want to do about border security? Well, we have, we have, I know what I would like to do. I'd like to support, spend more money in the countries where the asylum seekers are coming from. This is a real problem. So that they don't have to go through what they're going through, losing their kids, having their kids go be recruited into gangs, having the rule of law completely fall apart. So we need to help them restore the rule of law so that they can live in the country where they want to live, most of them, and not have to spend their life savings to march 2,500 miles to get to the border and then take the chance of getting asylum approved. This is a legal um, right that they have based on American law and uh, on uh, treaties that we've signed and there is a process when they get here. About 20% of them actually get legal asylum. Most of the rest end up going back to their country of origin because they don't qualify. So this whole idea that they're coming across the border, um, they're invading the country, I always think is sort of funny. Uh, you've got 2,000 to 10,000 people going through all this. They're largely unarmed families and the most powerful country in the history of the world is somehow being invaded and overrun. We do have an immigration and a border security problem, but we need to talk to each other about how best we invest to stop that and make it work as best as we can for American public and also the people who are seeking asylum. Well, what happened was we had an agreement, Mitch McConnell, um, Senator Schumer, the Democratic leader in the, in the Senate, and the president had an agreement. So this, the, the Senate actually voted on this agreement by a voice vote, which means there's no opposition. It would pass unanimously. We flew back during the Christmas vacation, uh, time off vacation with the idea that we would vote in the House. What happened was the president got up in the morning and Fox News criticized him for not getting the wall. So he changed. Uh, and I can tell you a lot of my Republican colleagues personally, privately, were not happy about that either. So this is the new demand. He wants 5.7 billion to build a wall. Um, we, I'm on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I was the ranking member at a hearing. Um, a year or so ago, we had experts, including the Border Patrol, come and testify up in front of us. This is when Trey Gowdy was the chair of the full committee. Um, Ron DeSantis was the chair of this budget subcommittee, the current um, governor, the just elected governor of Florida in a close uh, election. And what we heard at that hearing was building a wall is not the best investment in order to deal with the southern border. So um, 5.7, we have estimates that you, if you actually went ahead with that wall, it would be as, could be as expensive as $70 billion. Having been involved in big projects in the state of California, like this, the eastern span of the Bay Bridge, I don't like to spend money for things that haven't had a cost benefit and had an analysis to make sure that we're not misspending your taxpayers' money. God knows we have enough needs to spend money on rather than spend on something that the experts are telling, at least me, and there's a divergence of opinion. The Border Patrol uh, Union now says that they would like it, uh, which is not what the testimony we had when the head of that came in front of the committee. Um, but that's their perspective. I have to consider as a member all of our perspectives. And we've got needs to retire our deficit and our debt, which the Republicans just increased by a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, we, need, we, need, we need money for behavioral health, for education, transportation infrastructure. I don't think we should be spending money in this kind of way.
So this is just since we, this session of Congress, Congress goes for two year sessions, uh, since we started and the Democrats are in the majority, since January 3rd, we have passed uh, nine bills um, and sent them over to the Senate where Senator McConnell, and this is another problem I have, as many of you have, have heard in the past, leadership in either houses should have bills go to the committee and go to the floor so the voters in those areas can see how their representative or their senator voted and hold them accountable. Um, if, if they're happy with what they did, this idea that you don't have votes because you don't want people to be held accountable is, I think, another one of our big problems. Next. So this is just, these are some of the things that I've done. Uh, the last bill came from a, a freshman member from California, T.J. Cox, it's a good idea. Uh, we introduced a bill that would require the Treasury Department to give interest-free um, loans to all affected federal employees, and I would, I would increase it to, to all the contractors as well. We've led a, an effort uh, with a group of members to the credit unions, banks, and mortgage lenders to their associations, asking them to be more proactive in doing these kind of things, and it's helped get more of their banks and credit unions to be supportive every day. There's more. Uh, we've engaged Governor Newsom in his office to help with uh, the, uh, the um, assets that he's trying to put forward, including unemployment insurance. And then we've asked uh, Sally May to make sure that um, if you have a mortgage with them, that they would forgive your mortgage payment until we get this thing settled. And we're open to new ideas. So this, this is the Homeland Security study, which we are trying to get a hold of, but the administration is holding. Um, what, what we've heard so far is $22 billion just to start the construction of this, and as I said earlier, 40 to $70 billion in additional cost. And keep in mind that of the people in this country who are undocumented, over two thirds of them are here because they came here legally with visas and overstayed their visa. So this wall is not going to do anything to deal with the two thirds who are here. So if you're concerned with that issue and you're, you differ from me about how we should address it, just think of the logic from a business management standpoint of why would you spend $70 billion when that's not where the problem is. Next. Uh, if you can see this, um, this is from George H.W. Bush to Donald Trump, and the line indicates the number of illegal crossing in the southern border. And so when the president says we've got a huge crisis uh, and they're coming over in waves and terrorists, uh, you can see that that's not true. I mean, I know it's shocking to many of you to think that he, he didn't tell the truth, but um, <laughs> it's just not true. All right, next. So uh, he has said, frequently that we believe dem all Democrats want open borders. We're encouraging horrible people to move here. That's not true. I haven't heard one of my colleagues say that they believe in open borders. You have to have an immigration policy if you're a sovereign country. You have to have immigration, immigration rules and controls. Um, that's the nature of the nation state. And so we want to do it, but we want to do it effectively. And we want to do it in a way that's reflective of this country's uh, ethics and morality when it comes to immigrants. Every person in this room, most likely, or almost every person, unless you're of uh, Native American descendancy, um, has a story about a great-grandparent or a great-great-grandparent grandparent or yourselves as immigrants. Um, I used to listen to my grandparents talk about their trip from Ireland and the French side of the family to get here. Um, this is part of the process, and it should be done in a legal way with the public policy discussion about how we're going to how we're going to manage it um, and how the needs we have for the economy. And I think again, as the inscription on the on the Statue of Liberty says, that we are a welcoming country and we understand that we need people from other countries to be part of the American process. So we want, on the last one particularly, and I agree with actually something that I heard the president say, we need to get more infrastructure at the border. I, I met with, uh, when I was down there, we met with a, a judge who was appointed by George W. Bush. Um, and I think for those of you who've heard this story before, he came to meet with eight of us who were down there to look at the zero tolerance policy. And he said, I, when I heard you were in my courthouse, very big courthouse, in McLean, Texas. He said, I wanted to tell you that what the President of the United States, how he's describing the people who come through my courthouse is not the truth. These are families seeking asylum. So, uh, 
let's see. So, in my, this is my opinion. Um, this president is very good at distracting us from real issues. We have real challenging issues in this country. I'm gonna go through a couple. Um, and again, for those of you who've heard me speak before, inequality, uh, the lack of opportunity for younger Americans, housing, improving our education system, getting an economy that works for everybody, getting wages up. All of these things are real complicated issues, healthcare. Um, and this is distracting us from focusing on things that we really need to get down into and negotiate and have compromise with our colleagues on the other side and to help the quality of life, particularly for all of us, but also for future generations. The longer we get distracted by this stuff, uh, the worse it is. However, there's obviously real concerns um, about some of these things. Uh, the Mueller investigation, obviously, we await what he finds out. So all of this distraction takes us away from these other things that uh, you don't read about it, but many of us are hard at work focusing on a lot of these issues right now. We're working really hard in the DC office and with the committees I'm on to get our legislative package together. Um, it's great to be in the majority so that we can pass bills out that help American workers. Yeah. Okay, in other news, um, so these two, two things I wanted to talk about. The, the most significant thing um, that happened when uh, in the last session was the tax reform bill. Uh, we did a wonderful town hall in Arinda um, right after this happened. Uh, so it didn't have any, any committee hearings. Um, it, it, it was the, the last time we had major tax reform was when Ronald Reagan was president and Tip O'Neill was the speaker. So we had a divided um, government in DC. They worked their issues out, um, but it took almost a year from when they started to when the legislation was passed. In this instance, uh, there were no hearings and it was done within six, six weeks. Uh, and it, to me, um, it was the worst thing we could do for the things I've just mentioned, inequality and lack of opportunity for younger people, because it's shifted what is already at a historical time, which we'll show in a couple of slides that for those of you who are frequent flyers have seen before, this inequality we have is making it worse, not, uh, not better. So it's absolutely the worst thing in my view we should have done. And obviously I vote against it. This, this, this chart is interesting because of uh, the issue to the right. Um, who benefited from the tax plan? Foreign investors. So in a global economy now where American corporations are world corporations, um, as are German, Japanese, uh, and other countries' corporations, um, there's a free flow of investment. So a significant portion um, actually went to foreign investors. So if you're an American first person, you would wonder why you would want to do that. Uh, and this is where the benefit went. This is a, a, re a, a relatively recent um, uh, study from the Tax Policy Center. We try to put where we get our numbers from, so if you question my numbers, that's fine, but you can go uh, and see the validity or whether they're left of center or right of center groups. Uh, this is a, a very well-respected, um, generally nonpartisan um, group, and you can see where the benefit's gone. So if on the far right, that the largest, the largest group that with the most benefit is you have to make a half a million to a million dollars a year. Uh, and then the next biggest group is over a million dollars a year. I would opine those are, the, those are not the people who need a tax cut. <laughs> so this is a graph from 2013 till now on uh, corporate tax receipts. And you can see what's happened since the tax plan was passed. We've lost a lot of money. Now the theory was by, um, by the people who supported this bill was that you would have trickle down and the corporations would reinvest and there's been, uh, I know, I didn't, there's, there's no history to indicate that that's what happens. Um, so the money hasn't gone back in to get wages up. It hasn't gone back in, into investing in capital and research and development. So um, it's benefited people who the last chart, chart reflected to. So there's nothing wrong with making a lot of money, um, but we should all play by the same rules and no group should be benefited over another. And that's what's happened because of campaign contributions, if you ask me in this country. Next. Um, this is specific, so our district, on um, the fourth um, bullet down there, we were the 40, 43rd out of 435 districts most negatively impacted by the tax reform bill. So it capped 
what you could do on your mortgage deduction and your state and local taxes at 10,000. The average in this district is almost 20,000. So this district, roughly 50% of the people who live in this district lost $10,000 of deduction on the state and local taxes and the mortgage deduction. And then they also lost very similar numbers, about 50% on student debt, student loans, because um, we've got a district where people, the demographics are such that people really respect education and want their kids to get a, a college degree. So we were very, very negatively impacted. And we'd like to change that. Okay, just a couple words on inequality because this is, I think, that something that we, sh these, this is the real issue for kids is opportunity and inequality. Um, this chart goes from the far left uh, from 1910 to 2010. Uh, with 1950 and the war, the 40 to 50 is where it dropped the inequality because we were all in it together to be in it during World War II. Uh, and we created this remarkable middle class where there was great opportunity and people could move up within a generation. They could access college degrees and, and um, do really well, buy a house, have retirement. And now we've swung back the other way. Um, I won't bore you with Thomas Picardy, but I will mention it, that Thomas Picardy, who wrote a very well-known, very respected book with research uh, called Capital in the 21st Century. His basic formula is when he looks at all the history, he's an economic historian, when he looks at developed economies, when investment returns are consistently higher than, than, the, than, uh, than the economy in general, then you get greater inequality. And at some point there's an implosion, either a social implosion, implosion, or you go through the democratic process and fix it. And we're in one of those periods of time. We have to change our tax code so it's more reflective of what we had during the 40s and 50s when Eisenhower was president in the 60s, where we grew by six, over 6% 6 every year and we had a really robust middle class where people could move up and do well. And we've lost that. And this graph, I think, just sums up what I just said. In the blue is the percentage of capital as a percentage of gross domestic product. The red is wages. So you can see what's happened. There's a huge shark's mouth right now. And that's the problem, is that people, if you, if you live, if you have good investments, and many of us do because of real estate, and this part of the, of the Bay Area is a wealthy area, this economy is good for you. If you're trying to make, make it go by wages, you're, you're struggling, and your actually purchasing power has gone backwards. So um, when I see young people in particular, I, might, I have two kids, I say I don't want to be morbid, but if you want to buy a house, you're going to get, you're going to get what equity I have at some point, so let me help you now. Um, because if you, they live in Los Angeles, I know it's a mistake, they went to school in Los Angeles. <laughs> but they're still Giants fans. <laughs> But I know that they struggle all the time with trying to figure out you know, when they want to have kids, when they want to buy a place, and this needs to be changed for them. This is the most important thing for those of us who are baby boomers. This is our legacy to future generations. We have to change this. Now, this is exciting in Congress. All right, this actually is really exciting for me. So this is, this is where I was when all those depressing 74 town halls you came to. <laughs> and I was in the minor minority, and thanks to this remarkable turnout of really engaged people, particularly young people, people of color, uh, who got out to vote in the midterms, we have this remarkable uh, new freshman class that was on the floor Thursday. And it's Just, it's amazing to sit there and be on the Democratic side of the House and see that room filled with, it looks like America. It's women, men, the biggest group of women ever in the history of this country got elected. <laughs> first, first Native Americans uh, elected to Congress, first Muslim Americans elected to Congress. Just a reason. A really remarkable group, very similar to what was called the class of 1974 that Congressman Miller was part of as a result of Watergate and the Vietnam War. This is a very similar group. I got to sit there and watch us elect and swear in the second woman speaker in the history of this country who happened to be the first woman speaker. And, it, and to think this is happening. This is where you've got to believe the gods are watching us, or goddesses. 
This is the, this year will be the hundredth anniversary of the passing of the Nineteenth Amendment, giving the women the right to vote. I have a great I have a great print in my office in D.C. that I got from the Library of Congress. It's from uh, 1920, and it's got a woman standing up with a light. Uh, over an American map, and she's in California going east. Well, if you know the history of the 19th Amendment, it was passed as states allowing women to vote in the West first, and then it happened last in the East, like today. Most good things happen out here first, if you ask me. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so it's really interesting. I had a conversation for, with one of the more famous new members, and we're going to mention her name, but um, I was encouraging them not to get worn down, that uh, they have to stay out it, they have to understand how the process works, but they can't get worn down. This country really needs their enthusiasm and their perspective. Uh, this is a country that's not supposed to be just about uh, white males over 50. This is supposed to be about all of us, and our, our caucus reflects it. So um, during the last four years, we get this question a lot. Um, are you able to work across the aisle? And my answer always is yes, on the things where the things that aren't big media stories that are defining in re-elections. So I've been able to move quite a few amendments and bills. Uh, some of the amendments have been really terrific, working with Republican colleagues. Uh, Glenn Thompson, who's a wonderful member and is on the Education Labor Committee, I've been able to work with from Western Pennsylvania. Um, uh, Ted Poe, unfortunately, just retired, was my co-chair of my uh, Survivors Caucus in, in um, the Congress. As many of you know, I'm a survivor of leukemia. Uh, Ted had another form of leukemia. Um, so in the, in the context of big things like the shutdown where we just can't work together, I do want to tell you that on a day-to-day -day level, there are a lot of us who work across the aisle and try to get things done, and we've been successful three initiatives down here. So what you focus on in my experience in the legislative office is you can't do everything. You can't chase every shiny object. You can't chase everything that comes up every day. So you try to focus in areas of interest where you develop expertise. I'm on the Educational Labor Committee and the Transportation Infrastructure Committee and on the Oversight Committee. So I try to focus on those three areas. There are areas that are important to you. Education and transportation, historically, in the time I've been in office, have always polled one and two, uh, generally, with some changes once in a while. Public safety was for a while. Uh, the environment's very important for this district. So those I stick with. Uh, the first bullet here, I spent three years with um, three colleagues, Mark McCann most, most significantly, a wonderful member who's uh, chair of the Progressive Caucus from Wisconsin, and we went around the country talking to experts about what's the future of work, wages, and labor. We've got a really significant policy um, from that. We went to Wisconsin University, where Mark uh, represents Madison. We went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, the University of Michigan, where Debbie Dingell, who was another partner, and then uh, Rutgers is where Don Norcross represents. Uh, those are th four of the best, and we started at Berkeley with Stanford uh, contributing to that. And we've gotten this re rich research, also went to Harvard and MIT. So we're, we are in the process in the education committee of just lining up bills um, that will help middle class workers. And uh, in my view, we, I would like to have them on a committee, um, have them off the floor. We will pass them, send them over to the Senate, and hopefully American workers and middle class people will understand who's on their side when we send these bills out. Um, so, and then urban regional studies has been a wonderful thing that I started with Peter DeFazio. He's a member from Oregon who chairs the Transportation Committee. 64% uh, of the U.S. economy is now all in these urban areas. Uh, we're in San Francisco is sort of the leader at this. Uh, and we've got the issues of housing costs, transportation and congestion, inequality. How do people who make 15 bucks an hour as janitors get a place to live in Silicon Valley or in San Francisco? Only 8% of the people who work in the city and county of San Francisco can afford a median price housing unit in San Francisco. So these, we've gotten a lot of benefit from the urbanization, but we've got huge challenges. And this group, um, really excited about the things we're doing. And a lot of members, particularly a lot of the new members, have shown an interest in in joining this caucus. 
So I mentioned what committees I am on. Next week I'll find out whether I will chair a subcommittee. I'm hoping for workforce protection uh, in the Labor Committee so I can go around the country and show people again um, what this administration is doing to strip worker protection and where worker protection is being reinforced in places like California. Um, but I'll find out. I'm, I'm either, I think I'm either going to be chair of that committee or vice chair of the Education Committee. Uh, Bobby Scott from Virginia, who's a good friend, will be the chair. Uh, and oversight I've always liked. Um, I think the proper operation of government is what we do in local government at E. Um, so when I was on the city council and the board of supervisors, the most rewarding part many times was just overseeing the proper and efficient operation of the government. That shouldn't be partisan. Um, that should be just us doing our job and doing what you want us to do. So with Elijah Cummings, if any of you saw 60 Minutes last week, yeah, wasn't he great? Elijah Cummings, he's really one of the remarkable members of Congress, represents Baltimore. It's a wonderful scene on 60 Minutes. They're taking him walking down to his house that he's lived in 33 years, and he's got a little sign in the window to re-elect him for Congress, and he says, if I can't win this neighborhood, I'm really in trouble. <laughs> I don't dare look at my neighborhood. I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid my neighbors are maybe not voting for me. Um, but that committee, it's really important, and Elijah's been good on this, is that we follow the facts to the truth and don't become overly partisan the way it was done the last six years. So just let the American public figure this out for themselves, but we need to do proper oversight um, of government functions, and uh, this committee has brought destruction, uh, destruction, Freudian slip. Um, <laughs> this committee has a lot of jurisdiction over the private sector as well. So we can, for instance, opioids, um, I've done a lot of work in that field, mostly because I've had sad stories from cons constituents here who have lost children uh, to opioids. So that's, that's where you can get a hold of us, and now Ryan will come back, and we will go to questions and answer. Thank you again for paying attention. And with that, we will start with our first question. Our first question is from Terry. My son works for the Census Bureau and is furloughed. Please comment on the possibility that furloughed workers may not receive back payment. Uh, that won't happen. First of all, it's really different being up here. Um, <laughs> I was down at the Women's March before this and they had a little, little yeah, it was great. Revolutionaries on Broadway at Walnut Creek, who would have thought? Um, but they had a little stool or step up for me to get up to, and I, I, um, I said, I don't think I should go up there because I get excited and move around, I'll go right off. Um, so hopefully I won't go off here. So we were able to pass on a bipartisan vote in both houses and the president signed a piece of legislation guaranteeing that every federal employee who is furloughed, who is not getting paid, will be repaid. So that's good. That, that was important because it helps us with these financial institutions to say, you can afford to give these folks a cash advance at zero interest because they're going to get paid back and they'll pay you right back. And you can make a lending agreement that's pretty simple, one pager to get, make sure that that happens. Our next question is from Brian. Last town hall, you agreed that immigration is Congress's job, not any president's. You complained that Speaker Ryan would not bring any good bills to the floor. Now that your team is in charge, how soon should we see these good bills? An annual budget would eliminate these shutdowns, yes? Well, um, one of the great things about being a politician is I, the, number of, the number of words that get put in my mouth sometimes are hard to digest. So with all due respect to who said that, and, and maybe I didn't communicate well, um, the fact of the matter is it's the federal government's responsibility, ability, immigration. So that's both houses of Congress and the President of the United States and then the courts, the federal courts to adjudicate if they think we are doing something that's unconstitutional or illegal as they have opined in the zero tolerance policy. Um, so I have said this over and over again um, that we need immigration reform. As many of you know uh, who've been here before, I've mentioned this over and over again, there was a bipartisan bill a session before I got elected to Congress in 2014, uh, co-authored by four Republicans and four Democrats, most notable of uh, Marco Rubio and John McCain on the Republican side, Dick Durbin and, um, and Schumer on the Democratic side. It passed out of the Senate. 
with bipartisan votes overwhelmingly came to the House, never got a vote. And what we know now is because uh, the Freedom Caucus and Steve Bannon said, we shouldn't vote on this, this is a good issue. This is my opinion of what I've read on the, on the, on the research from uh, really good journalists, is, and we've been stuck ever since. Um, and part of it is the political narrative and independent expenditures. Uh, they create this narrative that uh, they're going to mail out hit pieces or do TV ads when we run for re-election describing what we did in a way that isn't accurate. And this happens both sides, uh, both sides of the political spectrum. And independent expenditures uh, and Citizens United was a huge mistake in my view by a five to four decision of the Supreme Court. We would, as part of our package, is amending that to make sure that corporate status is not equal to personal status. But it is fair to say it's our responsibility, and that's what we should be doing. And it's frustrating that we're not doing it, and it's frustrating that these people outside the institution are leveraging these mistruths um, to make people afraid to do what they sh should do, which is compromise and figure a way to come out with immigration reform. Um, we've been through this before in this country. If you, if you know the history of the European wave of, of immigration in this country in the 1800s and in early 1900s, there was a quota system. Um, and that changed based on what the federal government was looking for. I'm predominantly Irish. I hide behind a French name. My mother would be thrilled that I brought this up in front of you. <laughs> so I was talking about, you know, you're really Irish. You should. You should. Um, so we brought a lot of people from Ireland over here, a little country that still has only four and a half million people um, because uh, the British sort of wanted the Irish out of Ireland. There was the potato famine and we needed cheap labor. So they came to places like I grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts and worked in the mills, similarly with all of that wave. Now the significant wave of immigration is in the Pacific Rim and from South America, Central America and from Asian countries. All of this is a discussion that we should be having as a country about what do we need, what should we be accepting, um, and as I said, it should be based on what's in everyone's interest, but also with keeping in mind the spirit of this country and how all of us got here and how we were able to contribute to this wonderful country. So, um, fair criticism in the sense that it's all of our responsibilities. Our next question is from Ms. Carolyn Priest. You had requested to read your question. Would you still like to do that? Okay. Ryan, before you go, I, I forgot to answer the last question. So the last part of that first question was, what are we going to do about it now that we're in control? We are going to do a lot of thoughtful bills that we support, um, for instance, on securing the border. Spend it on the technology that actually works. Uh, get more infrastructure so people aren't kept waiting in line to go through their legal process to seek asylum. Um, but remember, the questioner said, we're in charge. We're in charge of one house of one branch. Uh, it requires 60 votes in the Senate, so the Republicans still control that. So there's gonna have to be give and take here if you wanna actually effectuate policy. Okay, uh, Ms. Priest's question. Do you think Congress could agree to provide $5 billion towards enhanced U.S. border security as proposed? and recommended by a panel of experts from NSC, TSA, law enforcement, and civil tech engineers. That yeah. would put President Trump on the spot. Yes, so I've said that one of the things, one of the ways out of this is to ask the experts. Do a cost benefit, come back to Congress and the administration, tell us the best way to secure the border and alleviate the humanitarian crisis. Um, the, you should listen to experts, I've always thought. So if, if we, if, if I had my way, he'd shut the, it end the shutdown now, and then we would convene all these experts, all of the public would be able to hear what they had to say, and then we would have a public debate in the normal legislative process, and you could decide for yourself where we stand. And then I'd have to come out to town halls and explain to you what I was thinking and why I was voting. And then you could choose, you know, what you wanted to do. You might not want to vote for me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, um, our next question is from Porfirio. Are you willing to support a legisl legislation that would include DACA and TPS together? Yes. Yeah, we should, we should, one of the things the president suggested was temporary protection for DACA kids, um, these are the dreamers, 
uh, for three years. And we should do permanent legislation. We have bipartisan bills. Uh, Will Hurd, who's a wonderful Republican member, um, has served on committees with me, who represents the longest section of um, the border in Texas. He's a former CIA analyst and staff person. He's against the war, the wall. But he would support, and he has a bill with a uh, uh, Democratic member from Southern California um, that would give a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And it's, it would take 20 years. You have to go to school, you have to have a job, you have to not get uh, arrested or convicted. Um, and then you, you can, at that point, you can apply for citizenship. And that's basically what we should do. That was, that's what they worked out because you've got a Republican and a Democrat, you had to compromise. I wouldn't take that long, but as I said, if you want to help these kids, you're going to, you, you can either go for a whole loaf and get zero, or you can work with them knowing they have control over one house, and in that instance, they had control over both houses. So that was the compromise. And in that period of time, they're protected. Our next question is from John. Has there been an audit of the 5.7 billion wall proposal, labor from where, steel from where, other costs, and time for construction, et cetera? No, this is one of the problems. So the General Accounting Office, you can go online, they did an initial study that they came up with some of the numbers behind there. <laughs> when I was a Republican and I was a small business owner, one of the things was to be fiscally responsible. They're not anymore. I hate to say that. I think a lot of them, knowing them personally and having friendships with them, want to go back to that model. But you don't start a project like this. I mean, I've been critical of high-speed rail in the state of California. I've been critical of, uh, even though I believe in high-speed rail, but it's not being done the right way. And I chaired both committees in both houses um, of the legislature and did a lot of hearings on this eastern span of the Bay Bridge, which I was regretfully involved with. We have to be fiscally responsible. I mean, it just have to be. And ironically, you know, when I was, used to be that the Republicans sold themselves as a fiscally responsible party, yet lately I would, I would not be able to define them that way at all. And we need to do a better job. So we should do a full analysis and let the experts tell us what the best way to do it is. And then we have a debate and talk about it. But just having political opinions is not the way to do a big, a big capital investment like this, in my opinion. Our next question is from David Stanley. You had requested to read your own question. Would you like to do that still? Okay. I'm a retired career IRS manager. During the last 10 years, Congress has systematically cut back our funding for tax administration, crippling the effectiveness of the IRS operations. Do you have any plans or proposals to strengthen this situation? To yes. address this situation? Yeah. So um, this has been deliberate, in my view, uh, from people who want to make you less effective at implementing the laws we pass and collecting the taxes that we all agree to, to pay. Um, as Madison said, was it Jefferson? Taxes are the price we pay for civilized society. So we need to be efficient, as I've said, about how we spend your tax money. We need to be efficient with the IRS, and that includes hiring enough staff for them to do their job. And um, we haven't done that in the previous uh, Republican-controlled Congress is, in my view, watching this and being on the Oversight Committee, they have deliberately done as much as they can to make it harder for you to collect taxes. Our next question is from Gwen. Will I continue to receive my Social Security check during the remainder of the shutdown? Yes. So the shutdown, um, does it, it's not the whole government. Um, Homeland Security is a big, big area, which the Coast Guard is part of. Um, one of the really strange things to this whole process is Border Patrol officers are not getting paid, even though they're required to do their job. Um, air traffic controllers, who I spend a lot of time with because I'm on the Transportation Committee and have a fairly significant bill there to remedy the issues around the near miss at, at San Francisco SFO. Um, they're already overworked. Some of them are working 18 hours a day and they're not getting paid. So that's just ridiculous. I mean, if you work in the state of California, if you're a private employer and having been one for 35 years, if you don't pay your employees, you're breaking the law. You have to pay them at the end. I think it was when I was in the restaurant business, three business days after the end of the pay period as defined. So we're doing something that we would consider illegal in the state of California, and it should be illegal. If you work 40 hours a week, you should get paid for it. By the way, 
there's a bill in the Senate, uh, Senator Portman, Republican, has a bill that I am going to co-author. Um, he had it last session that would make it illegal for us to shut down the government. <laughs> Our next question is from Nathaniel Perguini. Uh, you had requested to read your question. Uh, would you like to do that? Um, so my question is regarding the national parks. We've seen during the shutdown, there's been a lot of vandalism, damage, and littering. And do you think this will um, lead to an attempt to privatize the national parks as an attempt to, quote unquote, clean them up? Better not. As Ken Burns did in his wonderful series, National Parks are America's best idea. Um, we can take some pride in that. I have a picture in my office in D.C. that I got a long time ago of John Muir on Half Dome with Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was the first president of the United States to visit California. Um, as many of you know, I owned a restaurant named after him. And um, it's, it's a historic legacy that this country should be incredibly proud of. I am old enough to have a lifetime senior pass to the National Park. I would suggest it to anyone who's in my age group. Um, so it, that's another, this is just, and it, but it's, it, if there's a bright side to all of this, the amount of response to volunteers and foundations who support the national parks, who have gone out, there was just a piece on the news hour um, a couple days ago. I, I only watch one hour of TV absolutely every day, and on the weekends, half hour, and that's the PBS News Hour if you want real information that's well thought out. Um, not to be offensive to anyone who may be here from some other media outlet. <laughs> I forgot you guys are still here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> social media but um, the parks have got to be it's, it, this, this piece was about volunteers who are maintaining a park and I can't remember which one um, we really need to get them open and get that staff back and, you know we have wonderful national parks here uh, in Contra Costa John Muir Rosie the Riveter and the Tile House are just terrific if you haven't visited them our next question is from Mr. Lance Bennett you had requested to read your question would you like to do that Oh, he's close. You're safe. I'm not going to give you another Yogi Berra joke. <laughs> yep. My name is Landis. Uh, I'm an airline pilot, and this shutdown is uh, leading to serious concerns for the safety of my passengers, my crew, my li my livelihood. If it continues much longer, there's uh, got to be serious consideration given to actually shutting down the national airspace system so that there isn't an accident dealing with something that the TSA misses or air traffic control makes a mistake or FAA inspectors that do safety inspections. Um, can you address the contingency plans if this continues much longer? Well, first of all, thank you for what you do. As somebody who flies a lot and will be in a plane on Tuesday, I am appreciative of the work you do in the airline industry and the level of safety that we have in the American airline industry. All of this is because of your training, um, what we do in terms of maintenance, which we have to maintain, and the civil, um, the, the public sector. Uh, these air traffic controllers, as I mentioned to you, I've been trying to help them because to live, there's a differential when you live in the Bay Area, but it's not enough for them. Um, so to get more, we're having, the, one of the TV channels did a special on this about how hard it is to attract people and to be air traffic controllers in high cost areas like San Francisco and LA. So we, ha we have to end this shutdown for that reason. I mean, that's for all of these reasons, but for the traveling public, what we're doing right now to walk by TSA workers who make an average of $19 an hour and to live in the Bay Area, it's just to not pay them, we as a country should be so embarrassed that we're not doing this. So. Your question is really a good one. I don't know the answer to that, but when, I, when um, I'm going to contact the staff in D.C. and say, what is the contingency plan? Because one of the things, um, having represented this area for a long time and having been involved in chemical and refinery safety, because Contra Costa has uh, one of the densest populations of hazardous material sites because of the four refineries we have, and having been formerly an air regulator um, in 
in the Bay Area and at the state level. One of the things we learned is the science of what's called human factors that the National Lab studies a lot. Uh, we have talked a lot with the FAA and the NTSB over the Air Canada flight about how do we make sure that pilots, many of whom came out of the military, and by the way, we're not having that happen, uh, both for air traffic controllers and for pilots like we used to. Um, how do we make sure that we're learning from the neuroscience and we keep learning that we're making sure that human factors and being tired, which is a big issue, whether you're a pilot or air traffic controller, if you're tired, you're not going to be paying as much attention. Um, and that's true for these refineries and chemical plants. So we've learned a lot about this because of the research on how our brain works and how we get fatigued. And this, what you just said, is a huge, huge problem. So um, we'd be happy to, and any insights you have, if you want to talk to me or talk to the staff, and we'll, we'll have the staff in DC uh, talk to the committee staff and the FAA and the NTSB um, this week. Our next question is from Francis. Another huge cost of the wall will be the environment. Can we prevent the administration from bypassing NEPA and other state governmental laws? Yeah, so, the, yeah. so this is one of the great unknown costs of what it would really cost because a lot of where this wall would go is on private property and as you can imagine because there's a watershed and a river there, there's a lot of environmental sensitivity. So the National Environmental Protection Act uh, would have to be adhered to, and one of the great defenders of that is uh, the court system, that you can have a private right of action to sue the government if they are not complying with the, the federal statute. So this is one of the real areas. The other part of just the geography of the wall, when you're in eastern Texas where much of this wall would go, um, the Rio Grande and the international border goes all in different directions. So in parts of that, what I've learned, having gone down there now, um, is that the where the international border is and where the actual uh, lines are are very different so they're back off the border and then if you're in brownsville for instance uh, which is a very busy port um, you've got people who, when i was down there the head of that port has worked for the um, border patrol for years there are 1,500 to 2,500 people going across, back and forth across that border every day. So then when you add thousands of people going there to try to apply for asylum, they don't have the infrastructure. They're so overwhelmed. And that's one of the reasons what our idea is hire more staff so they can process people um, because they're completely overwhelmed. The building down there uh, at that port was built in the 50s and hasn't been changed very much since then. So obviously the, the country and that border has changed in that, that those 60 years. What's going on? I see some movement. Our next question is anonymous. Are retirees of the portion of the federal government still receiving their pensions? I'm sorry, I didn't. Pensions? Uh, portions of the federal government employees still receiving their pensions. Yes. So your Social Security, your pensions will continue to be paid. And if something happens, please contact our office because they should be paid. Next question is from Mary Lee. Why do you refuse to negotiate on border security? Are you against the steel barrier proposed by Trump? It's not a, it's, 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 in order to negotiate, you have to have two sides. Generally, it's a good idea to have two sides that trust one another. Um, and I've been in a lot of negotiations. I'm 66 years old. I own businesses for 30 years, 35 years. Been in an elected office a long time. You have to have a give and take. And what the problem is right now, he's, even today, he's saying, I want my $5.7 billion dollars for an investment that I don't think is a good investment and all the experts don't think is a good investment. So we can sit down and negotiate, but you gotta have some give and take here. Um, and that includes our side. I mean, we, I would be willing to vote for a bill right now that would do what the experts tell us to do to make the border more secure. But it's gotta be in proportion to the, the issue because we've got lots of other things we could spend money on, including for all of you who are stuck in traffic. One of the one of the most important things this country needs to do is invest in infrastructure. We used to have, thanks to President Eisenhower and others, we have the best infrastructure in the world. We haven't reinvested in our infrastructure in so long. And then what's happening in terms of urbanization, it's trying to go, I was, 
invited to uh, go on a live uh, episode in, in San Francisco for a local TV station last night. I was in at, at Oakland, and I couldn't do it because of the traffic. And we were talking about with with uh, two different stations about their problems in getting their crews out. I mean, it's just hard to get places when you're responding to news. We've got huge investment needs, whether it's healthcare, education, transportation, spending money on something that the experts say is first of all not effective, and secondly is way out of proportion to the actual problem, I'm not gonna vote for that. And if you don't wanna vote for me for that because I do that, that's I hope you were responding that way to the right part of my observation. <laughs> It's okay. I had a great life before, too. <laughs> All right, our next question is also anonymous. What will a House investigation into DHS family separation policy accomplish? Can it pressure DHS into halting the practice? There is a court order. They've been told by a federal judge that what they were doing is illegal. So people need to be held accountable. If people are breaking the law, all of us, it's supposed to be a country of, of laws, the people who are separating kids, if they still are doing that, they need to be investigated and brought to justice. Our next question is from Peter. Paying federal workers should be considered a debt of honor and not allowed to be held up. Is there any legislation being considered to prevent this during future government shutdowns? Yes, so I mentioned, you had written this, but I mentioned the Portman bill, there are others. Um, so we should do that. We should do that. I'm speaking as a Democrat. We should reach out to our Republican colleagues, and in this instance, we have a Republican who's well respected in the Senate who has already done this in the last session and is going to do another bill. We should be prohibited from ever doing this again. Our next question is from Kat. What steps are being taken by all of Congress to restore a normal budget process? I'm tired of continuing resolutions for political wins. Thank you. So I had a conversation with the, our budget chair, John Yarmuth, a wonderful member from Kentucky, and we were talking about this. How do we get back to the re what's called regular order, a regular process where you have timelines, um, you adhere to the timelines, and with budget, we need to do that. Um, our budget, I like the budget process in California much better, um, but it is what it is in the federal government. It is in the Constitution that the House of Representatives is, it's got the jurisdiction of controlling the purse springs. Um, the founders thought that was the best way because we were the most representative of the branches, so, at least in their view. So we should do that. We should have a regular order. This idea of changing the rules uh, when you're in charge, I think is a mistake. There's a process. We, we all work in environments where there are rules and a process. We're human beings. We need, we need process. We should adhere to legislative process, just as I mentioned before. And with the budget, we really need to, because it's just very poor management of, of a huge, huge budget. Of the largest economy in the history of the world, almost $20 trillion. Now, we shouldn't be managing one of the, the biggest, 20% of the whole GDP is federal spending. We should be managing it better with much better stewardship from both sides. Our next question is from Jan. How much wall does 5.6 billion buy? <laughs> Is this a size question? <laughs> uh, we don't know. I mean, it's really, it's just. They want 250 miles. Yeah. Well, I. Can can we can can we? If if I've got 500 people who want to have their own town hall, this is not going to work. So that's not the information I have. So you have more information than I do. Um, we need to have it fully vetted with a cost benefit, and then we would be better informed including myself. Our next question is from Don. I am concerned about the lack of faith in our economy, which is causing large fluctuations of the market. What is being done to stabilize the market? 
Well, the, the series of bills that I will work on, uh, the Labor Committee, um, infrastructure would be helpful. Uh, I just finished a wonderful book called How Corporations Got Their Civil Rights. I would recommend it to anyone. Of the 50-year history of how the courts have redefined corporate citizenship. Um, and it's you don't read about it because court cases don't get as much attention as uh, campaigns or legislative elections and presidential elections. But what a corporation was required to do with social responsibility, what it paid in taxes uh, during the 50s and 60s was very different from corporations governance structure now. So we need to change that. Um, I have a bill that I will introduce that's modeled after what Germany does. Uh, it, would re it would require a third of a publicly traded uh, corporations, uh, uh, corporate board, a third of them would be employees. The Germans do it, it works much better because the employees are vested in the decision making process. So things like that can change this, but this is going to take a line, long time. It took 60 years for corporations to change the structure of their governance, um, and it's going to take us time to change it back, but we have to. It's one of the really important things in this country. We need, we need corporate social responsibility. So right now, um, for liability purposes, if you're a corporate officer, your main responsibility is the highest return on investment to the shareholder. It wasn't always that way. You had a social responsibility. When George Washington started the first corporation in this country, it was a license from all of us to form this group of individuals who invested in the corporation. And for that license, you were expected a social responsibility. We need to get back to that in this country. I, my, one of my favorite bills in the legislature was social purpose corporations. There's now thousands of them. Um, and it, it allows shareholders to say that there's another reason for the corporation to exist besides maximum return on investment. And then it protects the corporate officers from lawsuits. Uh, it was particularly important for people who were investing in corporations on renewables because they knew that the return on investment would take longer and they didn't want uh, large interests who didn't want renewables to buy the companies out when they were publicly traded and change the corporate mission. So now in California and now it's Delaware, all around the country, they have state laws and it's worked well. So you can do it. Our next question is Melissa Sanders. You had asked to read your own question. Which all right. The government shutdown is portrayed as a Trump versus Pelosi war. However, a presidential veto can be overridden by a two-third vote in the House and the Senate. What are you doing to compromise and negotiate the need for a two-thirds vote to end the shutdown? Yeah, so we would need um, two-thirds to override a veto in both houses. Um, that would require Republicans to, to compromise with us. Um, I have mentioned the things that I'm willing to do. I've had this conversation with, you know, a, a lot of people think that uh, there's a new book about the number of fistfights and duels that happened in the House of Representatives. I get it as a Christmas present for my daughter. And all that. <laughs> I think she was trying to dissuade me from running for office again. Um, okay, so I was just saying that a lot of people think, I'm sorry, my microphone shut off. Um, that we're fighting all the time. We actually, I'll speak for myself, I, I engage with my Republican colleagues all the time on a professional and personal level. So to answer your question, there are always discussions about when I go back on Tuesday, we'll walk to vote again, we'll be in committees, we'll be visiting each other's offices. What are things we could do to solve this problem? So that goes on, uh, not all members do that, but I think there's fairly robust. The, the problem, as I've said, is this demand. We had an agreement. The President of the United States changed it. The Republicans and Democrats agreed on a funding source and a discussion about border security. We should just go back to the original agreement before he changed his mind after he watched, listen to Rush Limbaugh. Next question is from Graham Huey. You had requested to read your question as well. Is there a way to bring it to the attention of the taxpayer that the United States government, us, will be, the U.S., will be paying the federal workers retroactively, are they working on not, or while they are working or not during the shutdown? So why not say that Trump is wasting billions of dollars for a work that is not being performed and is impacting millions of Americans? Is there a way? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I'd be happy to investigate it or listen to suggestions. Um, 
but again, as somebody who is a employer, if I put a schedule up, you come in and you're an hourly worker, you hit the time clock, you, when your wages are due, the wages are due. I'm legally responsible to give you your wages because you perform the functions of your, of your job. If this was happening in the private sector, it would be called wage theft and we would be suing them. The labor commissioner in California would be taking the employer, the federal government, to court. So we should pay them. Um, we shouldn't, they should be performing the function of their work. Most of the federal employees, and I've talked to quite a few now, want to do their job. I mean, look at the air traffic controllers, the, 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 the security people at the airports. They're doing their job and they're not getting paid. So we just, we really need to end this shutdown to the last question from the young lady who read her question is, there should be a real sense of urgency. I can tell you it's enormously frustrating for me personally, because it's just, this is malpractice on our part, generally collectively. And I most of the responsibility I give to the President of the United States, but if there was a way to fix this, I, I, I mean, my suggestion would be let the General Accounting Office um, go ahead, convene the experts, and then come back. But first you open the government, and then we get the experts to tell us what's the best way to secure the border and end the humanitarian crisis. And then, as I said, we have a debate that the public can listen to. But not having that, I just think, is really bad management on our part. Our next question is from Jacqueline. Over 7,500 plus families in Contra Costa County will lose their housing funding at the end of February. What are your thoughts to prevent this? Losing their, well, I'd have to know more specifically. Section 8. Oh, Section 8. Oh, okay, thank you, Chanel, Rockstar. Um, we need to fund it. And again, we need to engage uh, with, if, if that does happen and we've got to fight to fund it, We've got to engage with the people who contract with us and have Section 8, the, the landowner, the, uh, the landlords, to forgive the payments for as long as we can, and we can talk to financial institutions. So that's that's yet something else we can try to work on um, specifically for this district. What I hope with what we've done so far and what the district office has done is to work with other offices around the country to develop a template so we can all work better every day to make sure that people aren't as impacted as, as are as impacted negatively as little as possible. So double negative. Our next question is from Tim. Your opinion on Trump's proposal today to give DACA in trade for $5.7 billion for his vanity wall? Uh, he, he was much um, nicer today in his presentation. Other than that, there's, not ter there's nothing new in his proposal. So I, I think that was an attempt to appear to be reasonable. But, but this is, you know, having said that, if he wants to debate, if he wants to have a give and take, then he should just say that. And then the leadership should get involved and, and the leadership should get the rest of us involved in the way that I described and trying to work something that we can take the leadership and say, here, here's a way out nobody's thought about. And if you have suggestions, we're all ears. We'll give you a certificate. <laughs> Our next question is from Valerie. What action is being taken to reunite children that were taken at the border? So that, that's in the federal court system. The judges are holding them as accountable as they can be. Uh, I think we will, I'm hoping that Homeland Security Committee um, and the Oversight Committee will have hearings. We've got a lot on our plate, so uh, there's a lot to have oversight on, but this should be one of the things. The federal judge has said what they did in the zero tolerance policy is illegal. So they're breaking the law. Um, to the degree that they need more resources, this is another thing we should have a discussion about. Give them the resources they need so those kids are reunited as fast as possible. Our next question is from Bernie. As a member of the Oversight Committee, what answers are you seeking next month from one Michael Dean Cohen? Thank you for being a co-sponsor of HR 5A2, Raise the Wage Act. That's a great question. So we are allowed in, in the House of Representatives, uh, you, if you're on three what's called exclusive committees, which is Ways and Means, Appropriations, Energy and Commerce, those are the three committees, you're allowed to have one committee. If you're on two committees as I am, because these are the issue areas that I have some background in and I like, and you want me to be involved in, um, you can ask to be in a third committee. So I have to, I've asked to what's called wave on to oversight and government reform. I've been allowed to do that the last two sessions. The last session I was on oversight and government reform before I got on transportation. So I'm hoping that I will be there. Um, and 
The def there is some parameters to what we can ask Mr. Cohen when he comes in front of us in a public meeting hearing that you can watch. Um, uh, we're not supposed to get in the areas that the Mueller investigation is involved with, so that limits us. But most of what I would want to ask him, and I've got a lot of reading to do between now and then, um, and we as a committee have to strategize who's going to ask which questions and how you respond to it, which is wonderful stuff, uh, is mostly around truthfulness in his relationship with his client. How many times was it, you know, were you told to do something that was illegal or unethical, and how did you feel about that would be one I would but with a little more specificity than that. So we'll see, it'll be entertaining. <laughs> Our next question is from Dana. How come the Democratic Party doesn't do a better job of explaining why the wall is a bad idea? They need to explain what other options are better. I don't know. You know, I, I, I have done this for a while. Um, how we get information, all of us has changed dramatically. What's hope happened to the what used to be the Contra Costa Times is a subject of real regret to me. Um, how we use social media to get information, um, that's why I do a lot of town halls and why we record them because it's easier to just say you can hear it out of my own mouth. So I do think we have a problem and the, the president's very good at this, at getting us to respond to him rather than to say what our where we're going. So our plan, like on healthcare, for me personally, it's the Affordable Care Act with modifications as we've learned things that don't work on that, and eventually a universal single-payer healthcare plan. <laughs> Which the rest of the industrialized world has. Um, with higher outcomes in terms of health health outcomes. So on that, we didn't do a good enough job of just saying that. That's a simple way to articulate what your plan is in a very complex issue. On this, um, I, I can only say for myself, I've, I, every time I've been interviewed, which is quite a few times, um, the plan is to let the experts tell us the best way to secure the border and have a public debate about it. So we only have enough time for a few more questions, uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to state again that any questions that you had filled out on a question card and were submitted to us with your contact information will be responded to and you will receive an answer. Uh, additionally, if you'd like to rewatch any of the aspects of it, it's available on Facebook Live again. Our next question is from Mimi. Clearly the wall is a distraction. What in your informed opinion is the most likely course of action to be taken by Congress once the Mueller report is released? This is going to be really difficult, depending on what the content of the report is. Um, it's unlike anything we've ever been through before if, if there shows some connection with the Russians so that is criminal. I don't know if it will. If it doesn't, if it exonerates him, then fine. You deal with the facts of that. But if it shows something that's a felony, then the impeachment process um, is the way we will have to go about and urge our Republican colleagues to join us. So one of the questions I have is, who is Barry Goldwater? So for those of you who remember the history of Watergate, Barry Goldwater was the Republican senator who drove from the Capitol down to the White House and met with President Nixon and said, you need to resign. That's what's going to have to happen, is that people in, uh, someone in the majority party in the Senate is most likely going to have to carry that message to somebody who, in my view, um, with all of Richard Nixon's fault, this president is, doesn't have some of the positive attributes, in my view, that uh, Nixon had. And there were positive attributes. He signed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, amongst other things. So this is going to be really, really different. I was talking to somebody, um, just talking about the last time, you know, well, the closest we ever came to impeaching, removing a president was Andrew Johnson um, after the Civil War. Lots changed since then. Now, people didn't even know he was being impeached on the West Coast, most people, because if they were lucky enough to get a newspaper a week later, and now you get it right away. So this is, um, I stay awake at night sometimes thinking about how all of this will play out. But I think the cornerstone is you stick to the rule of the law, you stick to truth, and you let all of that out, and then the public will be informed and the country will be better off for it.
If he's innocent, I think that will come out. If he's done something impeachable, that will come out as well. This will be our last question. Uh, it's from Linda. What role can the House play to protect LGBTQ rights, in particular the protection of LGBTQ service members in our military? Great question. Well, we've tried. We've worked very hard at this. Um, the Pentagon has been great at it. Uh, they've done lots of research that shows, as opposed to what we thought 20 years ago, that LGBTQ soldiers are very good at what they do. So that's what we're supposed to protect. Is if you do your job well, we're not supposed to punish you uh, because of your sexual preference. So, with that, I just want to thank you all for joining us on a beautiful Saturday day. Thank you for putting up with my Yogi Baradell. They're left over from when I was a bartender.